Thirteen Ways of Looking at a Blackbird by Wallace Stevens Themes, Summary, Analysis Hello and welcome to the discourse. Thirteen Ways of Looking at a Blackbird is an abstract metaphysical poem by Wallace Stevens that was first published in 1917 and then added to his poetry collection Harmonium published in 1923. Structure of Thirteen Ways of Looking at a Blackbird The poem is written in imitation of the haiku style. Haiku or hoku is a Japanese verse form most often composed in English versions of three unrhymed lines of five, seven and five syllables. A haiku often features an image or a pair of images mean to depict the essence of a specific moment in time. The poem doesn't offer different ideas about a similar image of black bird, rather it offers different sensations for the same sight. The poem has 13 sections or cantos and while all of them appear to be imitating haiku style, none of them is a truly haiku. The poet used simile, imagery and metaphor to offer different sensations for the minimal sketches he draws in these 13 cantos. The poem is modernist and follows the pattern of cubism. In cubist literature, the subjects are analyzed, broken up and reassembled in an abstract form. Instead of expressing objects from a single perspective, the author depicts the subject from multiple perspectives to represent the subject in a greater context. Wallace expresses the seemingly common and ordinary blackbird in a way that makes it anything but ordinary because at a given instant, perceptions alters. Depending on the physical environment, the action of the bird and the effect of the, on the mind of the perceiver. While reading the poem, the reader would normally stress over the phrase to be to understand it. Themes The major theme of the poem is subjectivity versus reality. The poet suggests that there is no single correct way of seeing the world. Instead, the poem implies that reality is subjective and can be defined by whoever's looking at it. In the first canto, the poet plays with the word I, depicting it as I, the pronoun depicting individual. Through this I, people perceive things in the world, not just the blackbird but anything in general. The true essence of the reality of the blackbird or any other thing is altered by the perception of I from person to person and it differs in different situations too. The author suggests that truth is not one singular entity but a whole range of possibilities all held in a kind of irresolvable tension. It may appear like the quantum theory that suggests that unless observed, things remain in a state of superimposition and take a definite shape only when are observed. Thus, the reality is dependent on the observer and hence it is subjective and there is no singular true reality. Another theme of the poem is death. The black bird is a raven representing death. It is no ordinary bird or crow. It outlasts all other creatures. In the snow stands in as a muse for all the for the speaker and appears in several different forms. The bird is made up of more than its simple physiology. It contains beauty, innuendos and eccentricities which separate it from other creatures. Summary of 13 ways to look at a black bird. It is a circular poem that begins in a barren snow desert surrounded by over 20 mountains, then moves towards human society and then returns to the sparse snowy terrain as if completing the circle of life. The poet depicts a blackbird or different blackbirds in all 13 cantos, but the blackbird is in the subject of all these cantos. Canto 1. Among 20 snowy mountains, the only moving thing was the eye of the blackbird. The first stanza contains contrast, exaggeration and imagery. It is a tercet of 8, 6 and 7 syllables. The poet depicts a small blackbird in a large white expanse of snowy terrain surrounded by 20 mountains. There is a juxtaposition of 13 in the title and 20 mountains. 13 is a prime number indivisible by any other than 1 and itself, while 20 is an even number clearly divisible by 2, 4, 5 or 10 along with 1 and 20 itself. There is a contrast between the blackbird and the white snow. The bird appears as a tiny black spot on a huge white background. Again, the eye of the blackbird is mostly white except for the little black pupil of the blackbird's eye. 
Thus, the poet imagines a picture within the picture of or all white with a tiny black spot. The poet uses exaggeration to suggest that the only moving thing in the scene is the black pupil of the black bird. The bird doesn't move nor shakes its neck, but its pupil does move. Imagine a tiny black spot moving in a whole white background surrounded by blackness which is again situated in all white expanse. It is difficult to imagine that nothing else moves. Canto 2 I was of three minds like a tree in which there are three black birds. The poet uses first person narrative to relate with the bird and uses a simile like a tree which suggests the three tree of life. The poet is depicting an old memory and thus uses the past tense. The poet was in three minds rather than two minds. While the blackbird was keenly observing the snowy terrain, the poet was observing the blackbird and he could imagine the bird in three ways. The first appears to be a tiny black spot surrounded by a huge white expanse of snow and the second appears to be a tiny white speck of the eye surrounded by a whole black body of the blackbird. The third appears to be a further small black spot in the larger white expanse of the eye of the black bird. Wallace simply played with the expression of being in two minds and expressed that he could see three possibilities, three birds, each bird representing a different state of mind. Canto 3 The black bird whirled in the autumn winds. It was a small part of the pantomime. This is a couplet with no rhyming scheme but employs alliteration and assonance. The scene has been changed, everything is moving with the winds, and the bird is also flying in a peculiar whirling motion. The whole appears like a pantomime, a drama with no dialogue, with expressions presented through motion. The black bird is a part of the pantomime. The season has also been changed and it appears to be autumn, a time of high winds, blown leaves and uncontrollable birds. Canto 4 A man and a woman are one. A man and a woman and a black bird are one. In this stanza, the poet offers a completely alienated viewpoint. He offers a viewpoint of non-dualism and suggests that there is no difference between a man and a woman. Both are the same or one. Both are living and so is the black bird. There is no distinction other than the three, man, woman and the bird is alive, representing one force of life. It can also be interpreted as a man and a woman copulating and while they are sharing intimacy, the black bird observes them and sensually becomes one with them. Canto 5 I do not know which to prefer, the beauty of inflections or the beauty of innuendos, the black bird whistling or just after. The poet is in two minds now. He listens to the whistling sound of the blackbird and he cannot decide whether should he appreciate the inflections of the musical sound as the blackbird sings or should he cherish the silence just after the whistle offering innuendos or instructions while the whistle still lingers in the ear of the listener. Canto 6 Isles filled with the long window with barbaric glass. The shadow of the blackbird crossed it to and fro the mood traced in the shadow an indecipherable cause. Canto 6 is a seven line stanza with a full rhyme in lines 1, 4 and 6, window, 2 and fro and shadow, and lines 2, 7 and 3, 5 in slant rhyme, glass, cause, blackbird, mood. The blackbird began from a snowy barren land surrounded by ice-caped mountains and then it flew and is now in human society as it sits near a glass window of a house. It is cold outside while the poet sees through the glass of the window. He observes flakes of ice on the old glass window and while he is not able to see the blackbird, he sees the shadow of the bird on the glass. And then the poet explains what these varied scenes and situations are. These are his moods, his sensations that are influencing the shadow of the blackbird, but the poet cannot understand that influence. These lines can also be interpreted as the blackbird flies to and fro, casting its shadow on the glass window. The poet fails to decipher the mood of the blackbird, what is, what is causing it to hop here and there. The poet knows that it is the shadow of the moving black bird but some other observer may fail to interpret the moving shadow and would wonder what is causing the moving shadow. Canto 7 
O thin man of Haddon, why do you imagine golden birds? Do you not see how the blackbird walks around the feet of the woman about you? Canto 7 is five lines long in which Stevens names a place Haddon. He expresses another viewpoint of the shadow of the blackbird on the window. Some thin man from Haddon observe the moving shadow and they imagine it to be caused by a moving golden bird which shows their richness and extravagance. They imagine of some exotic things while blackbirds are so common in the area. However, their perception is too materialistic. Canto 8 I know noble ascents and lucid inescapable rhythms, but I know too that the blackbird is involved in what I know. Again a five line verse with first person narrative and Cicera in lines 2 and 3. The poet says that he knows a lot of beautiful and pleasurable things that are liked. He knows the ascent of the high noble class and he is aware of enchanting light lucid rhythms. But he says that all these pleasurable things remind him of the blackbird. Canto 9 When the blackbird flew out of sight, it marked the edge of one of many circles. The blackbird doesn't stay for long and flies away afar out of sight. Wallace uses juxtaposition again. The poet says that all that he knows is based on his observation of the blackbird and when it flies away, it marks the edge of his life. As the blackbird flies away, the expanse of his knowledge also continues to increase and marks a new boundary to it while he is at the, at the center. There can be infinite circles with the same center and the blackbird marks one out of them. The juxtaposition is between the eyes of, of a circle and the eyes of one's own life. Each person or creature has his o or her own horizon at a par particular moment. So the horizon that the blackbird reaches is only one of many. The circles of the poet and reader may differ as they are subjective. Canto 10 At the sight of blackbirds flying in a green light, even the bots of euphony would cry out sharply. In these lines, the poet suggests that the blackbird can influence everybody, and even a heartless, much less sensitive bird or the madam of a brothel will feel the pain of the blackbird's whistle and will start crying. Also, the poet compares the natural whistle song of the blackbird with the euphony, highly pleasing sound of artificial professional pleasure providers and suggests that the blackbird's whistle is much more impressive. Canto 11 He rode over Connecticut in a glass coach. Once a fear pierced him in that he mistook the shadow of his equipage for blackbirds. In this section, the poet informs about the progress of an unknown man from his home state of Connecticut as he travelled in his gl glass coach, a carriage made of glass windows ridden by horses. As the man saw the shadow of his own carrier, he was frightened as he mistook the shadow of the sh blackbird. Why would a man fear blackbirds? Either the poet is making fun of this man or he is suggesting that the blackbird isn't a mere bird but is a symbol of much greater force, the force of life that takes it forwards, the force of death. Canto 12 The river is moving, the blackbird must be flying. In the only, it is the only canto in which the poet uses the present tense. In this section, the poet suggests that there must be some entanglement between the river and the blackbird. If the river is moving, the bird must also be flying. The river is the river of life that continues to flow from mountains to the sea and back again. A moving river also suggests the melting of ice. The poem, poem begins in cold frozen terrain and the movement began in autumn. Now as spring approaches, the ice is melting and rivers are moving. It must be the time for the blackbird to migrate and hence, the poet is sure that the blackbird is flying. Canto 13 It was evening all afternoon, it was snowing, and it was going to snow. The blackbird sat in the sadar limbs. The poet again brings the image of the past and describes the blackbird when he saw it during the winter. He cannot see the blackbird right now because it is springtime and the blackbird has migrated away. The poet describes the day when it was heavily snowing continuously from afternoon to evening. When he saw the blackbird sitting in the cedar limb, a common place where the poet often observed the bird sitting. So this is it for today. 
we will continue to discuss the history of american literature please stay connected with the discourse thanks and regards